Equally at home in glittering comedy and gripping drama, she has appeared in 22 motion pictures, as varied as Top Gun, When Harry Met Sally, When a Man Loves a Woman, and Sleepless in Seattle. The Actors Studio is honored to welcome Meg Ryan. Hi, Meg. <laughs> when you were a child up north of here in Fairfield and Bethel, Connecticut, were there ever any intimations of or inclinations toward acting? No, not that I recall. What were your earliest interests? What did you think you might do, even as a child? I, I, I wanted to be a journalist. How old were you, for example, when you started writing things down? Well, after I read Harriet the Spy. How old were you? I think, well, what are you, in like fourth grade or something like that? I mean, it was early, early on. Did you keep a, any kind of notes? Or yeah, I had a diary for forever. I still have one. I'm very interested in diaries. Oh, but you can't read it. <laughs> <laughs> Sally Field Mr. accused. Mr. Research. <laughs> <laughs> Sally Field accused me of reading her diary. Um, and when you went to high school, was it still journalism, or was there any? Did you begin to be? Yeah, well, I, drama at all. I did some, you know, actually everyone did the class shows. You know, everyone in my high school class had to be in Chitty Chitty Bang Bang and, <laughs> you know. But weren't you a homecoming queen? Yes, I was a homecoming queen. What it's was true. That? Um, I was a homecoming queen by default. I had this thing where um, I, I think they expelled the person who won. I mean, I think you had to. <laughs> and then um, they made me into this homecoming queen, which was unbelievable because I had to ride through the town in this float that was the shape of the big teeth, and I kind of sat in the middle. Why was it the shape of teeth? Because we were going to chomp the other team for the homecoming. We were going to oh, get them. I see. I see. <laughs> see. After high school, you went to college just a few blocks from here. Yeah. Where'd you go? NYU. Okay, and, you, and your major was? Journalism. What? <laughs> and how did that go at NYU? Were you really, were, were you deep into it? Was it a very um, serious endeavor for you? I liked being a witness. You know, I liked witnessing the world. And I also loved the thing of being alone at your typewriter or with your pen, you know, and, and then making the world into what you wanted it, the, how you wanted to see it. I thought that was, I felt very powerful doing that. You know, I liked it. And I liked investigating um, uh, things and people. And, you know, I, 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 I loved it. I loved it. And, uh, I, but I was paying my way through by doing uh, commercials. I had a commercial agent uptown, and I'd kind of get on the train and go into the city and uh, go to school. And kind of in between classes, I'd, I'd uh, go uptown for these, you know, disco Burger King auditions and stuff. And, and that's how I paid my way through college. At a very early age, you found yourself on a set in a film called Rich and Famous. Yeah. What did you play in that? I played Candace Bergen's daughter. <laughs> How old were you? I was uh, 17. Was Candace nice to you? Very, very great. And uh, really funny and great. And Jack Jacqueline Bissett was in it, too, and Hart Bachner. And it was a big thing. I mean, I, I had to, um, to oh, God, I, I had some kind of a line, and I, I, one line, you know, in a, in a, in a deli. It was a portent. Ultimately, you were to have great success in a deli. Uh, uh. <laughs> uh, but so, uh, but then you went back to school after Rich and Famous. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. However, this was under new circumstances because you did begin acting then. And uh, there's a brand new element here. How many times has this theme, and it is a theme now, emerged on this stage? You all know where this is going. Alec Baldwin, and Chris Reeve, and Mark Rydell, what? and me, we all subsidized ourselves on a The best. So did you. The best. Tell us about it. It was just the best. I mean, in, in the way that you could just learn every wrong thing to do. <laughs> and, and beyond that, too, you, you really learn about just real nuts and bolts things, hitting your mark. and lights and uh, used just so many words to say. And delivering know? every day. Yeah. And what was your show? Yeah. Mine was As the World Turns. And what was your name? 
I was, yes, Betsy. That was, <laughs> <laughs> I was not only Betsy, Betsy, I was like Betsy Stewart Montgomery Andropolis. I was everyone I was ever married to. On The Guiding Light, I used to say that I married everybody on that show except my mother. <laughs> uh, your character was very complex, wasn't she? She yes. was also very popular. You were one of the top soap opera Well, oh, I don't sure know, but they, it was really, you know, what they, happened got, to they her? got you on the show. And they, they said, they gave me like this little family tree, which is this very complicated kind of diagram of how everybody was related to everybody. It was, it was insane. And then they, like they said to me in these kind of hushed tones, they said, you know, your mother, your real mother died falling up the stairs. <laughs> and I thought, that's it. She's a complicated babe, honey. I mean, she fell up. Did they said, ever explain it? No, it was left for me to, you know, think about for a long time. Yeah. Were you ever kidnapped? Again, I have to defer to you, was I? Mm -hmm. um, at the end? Well, everybody was. I mean, uh, everyone opera, was kidnapped. You're always kidnapped, opera. eventually. It's true. It's true. Uh, and, uh, uh, and you were pregnant? Uh, yes, but, but yes. But not yeah. by your husband? No, by the, uh, <laughs> because he was both sterile and impotent. <laughs> <laughs> but he thought I wouldn't get it, you know. Like, he thought, he thought I could just, I, it was unbelievable. Wasn't he also psychotic and a paraplegic? Yes, he was faking. <laughs> Huh? He, he was faking a paraplegia. Oh. And I was pregnant. It was incredible. Was he faking the impotence or was he? I don't think he was faking the impotence. <laughs> but then you got pregnant. <laughs> yes, by my Greek construction worker lover in, in Spain. What happened to Betsy when you decided to leave as the world turns? She just exploded. I mean, I'm not kidding. She, she, she was in a car. <laughs> And uh, just sort of unbelievably, she picked up a hitchhiker, which is something that Betsy would never do, but she did. <laughs> right. And uh, the one, I don't know, something happened. They, they cut to stock footage of my car exploding. <laughs> and then um, I think my, my la the last thing I had to do was get wrapped up in all these bandages and then be, <laughs> be placed on a, a, a flatbed truck and driven away. <laughs> I believe you went to Europe for a short time after that. Yeah, yeah. Is that an Gosh, adventure? Gosh, this is really wild. You're... Yeah, I went to Europe with rites the, of passage. With some was friends it fun? and the backpacks and uh, Ural passes and sleeping on the stones in Nice. Uh huh. Did you? Yeah, yeah. Uh, did you ever get your degree from NYU? No, I was like this close, a semester close? away. You were six credits short, I think. Yeah. When did it occur to you, Meg, that that maybe you ought to study acting? I came back from Europe, and I ended up going to, uh, oh, God, uh, L.A., and I did a, um, a, a TV show for Disney called Wild, Wild Side. Side yeah. um, then I found Peggy Fury, who uh, is, was, you know, incredible. She and her husband had an actor's studio in L.A. Do you remember when her name came up the last time? Angelica. Yeah, she Angelica was there. Angelica Houston. Who else was there when you were there? Amazing people, all of whom I was not in their class. They were like, it was like Angelica, I think Michelle Pfeiffer was there, and Sean Penn, and Nicolas Cage, and just unbelievable people. In retrospect, it was really incredible because her husband would be the, really the brass tax guy, you know? And she would say things like, you know what you should do to find that character? You should go see this painting in the museum. You should go listen to that music. You should go. And she, more than anything, had such a love of it and it was so contagious that you just wanted to be good for her. And so this whole other side of your brain started working. And it wasn't about getting it right. It was just about doing something so your soul came out a little. Yeah. I, I didn't think of myself as an instrument until I met her. And now you do, of course. Mm -hmm. Do you still use what you learned there? Do you find that it has remained part of you? Yeah. Yeah, in that it was a, a sort of a way of thinking that got sparked, or a way of not thinking. And Probably being in the more moment. importantly. And being yeah. in the moment. When Meg was all of 25, the pace quickened, and she played a, a small role, but a very impressive one, in a movie I liked a lot, because it's all about airplanes. It was called Top Gun. There's a very, very good scene in it when Goose has been killed and Maverick, that's Tom Cruise, is shattered. And it ends with you comforting him, doesn't it? You go Incredible, to him. Incredible, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. She ended up comforting him. Unbelievable. Um, as 
you know, any actor knows a lot of times you go in and you're working on a movie for two days, which is what happened in my case on that. And I, first day I got there and Tony Scott was the director, lovely guy, and he'd say, all right, Meg, you happy? And that was my direction. <laughs> <laughs> and then in the seconds that scene you're talking about, he said, all right, Meg, you're sad. <laughs> <laughs> Sums it up. Just get right to the point, doesn't yeah. it? Yeah. Inner Space is a movie with a very unusual premise. Yeah. Dennis Quaid is, I think, a failed astronaut, and he's miniaturized right. and injected into Martin Short. <laughs> and then he, he possesses Marty. It's a really funny movie. It's beginning to think. sound a bit like As the World Turns. Yeah, it's all. It? <laughs> <laughs> and Dennis had to be in, like, this little soundproof pod for the whole movie. Now, you've worked together three times. Yeah. On Inner Space, DOA, and Flesh and Bone. Uh, uh, just a quick question. Does having a real-life relationship, you're, we all know that you're married to him, uh, with someone, does it make it easier or harder to relate to each other in the work? You know, when we did Flesh and Bone, I, I was, you know, for about a year before, right before that, we were, all we did was change diapers together and, you know, wake up in the middle of the night, and, you know, and then you forget that you're married to this brilliant actor. Yeah. He's so good, but um, I, th I like, I, I found it harder when I, knew the, when I knew him better. Really? Yeah. Why harder? Because I found it, it took a lot more to surprise him, and it, I felt like he, you know, I'd rather him not know what I was giving away. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And uh, do, do you know what I mean? Yeah. So um, I felt more revealed or something, and I didn't, I wasn't really... I don't mind being revealed, but I just don't like to think I'm being revealed <laughs> in the moment. Uh, you've spoken of your role in DOA as a welcome relief. I just done a movie called Promised Land, and it was it was a, a really intense experience. And uh, DOA was very lighthearted, and so I think that's what I was referring to. And didn't you also say about it that that the thing that you liked about it was that she, this character, the woman, rare, was the funny one. Yeah, you know, because very often you're in this sort of satellite role where you might have a lot of screen time, but it's not important what you do, what actions you take, because the movie's not really about your actions or what you, you know, your desire. Is that a matter of gender sometimes? Uh, sometimes, we, uh, mostly, yeah. Th that the women are not central. Yeah, uh, very often you don't, you're not, you don't exist in the narrative in a, in a really important in way, and it takes a long time to find those, those roles. Uh, how much of yourself do you invest in a character? Is there always some of Meg Ryan in every yeah, character? Yeah, always. A lot? I think that uh, very often um, finding a character is about find, finding some, even if it's a little seed of that in you, and then expanding it so it takes you over, you know, and doing whatever it takes to, to figure out how that, that thing can take you over. So. Uh, um, sometimes you find that you have nothing whatsoever to do with this person and then you, th you think you don't and there's some little tiny part that rings a bell and that feels familiar and then that's the place you hope to find and then exaggerate. Okay. Then Harry met Sally. And everything changed for you and for us. Did you and Nora discuss that role a lot? It's such a well-drawn character. It's such a completely great script and there wasn't really um, a lot that I had to contribute in, in that way, you know, but I, I, she was someone who's so, so self-contained and so persnickety and so, I mean, she was very much like actually a friend of mine um, that I grew up with and so I, I thought about my friend Tracy a lot when I, <laughs> when I was doing the role. But um, now the subject of romantic comedy came up with Julia Roberts too and because we have had in just the past few weeks two women who are able to do it. Um, it's the rarest combination of a very beautiful woman who has an antic comedic gift. And there's a line, we talked about it then, we can certainly talk about it now. Uh, there was Carol Lombard, there was uh, Kay Kendall, uh, there was Audrey Hepburn. Um, were any of those people that I mentioned influences on you? Did you see them? On TV as a kid, are, are you aware oh, of their yeah. work, huh? Very, very aware of them. What did you think of Lombard, for example? You know, she was incredible because she had that real grace and then there's something kind of blue-collar about her, you know? Um, 
and just so unbelievably watchable. What about somebody like Rosalind Russell? With the, what was the movie she did, The Front Page? Or, yeah. Um, where they were just, I, I would watch that movie over and over again and just be, so, how could they talk that fast and get those jokes in and be with that rhythm and always be on? It was a really incredible movie to watch for, just for rhythm. I mean, I've done, I don't know how many movies where the director makes us sit there and watch that film before we start, you know. But Audrey Hepburn. Um, oh, yeah. She's a sort of like that great, unapproachable, beautiful, you know. But very uh, clever and very artful. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I think in romantic comedy, the important thing is to have it be in, you know, it's a strange little line you walk because it's, it's happening, but it's not happening. It's serious, but it's not that serious. It's, uh, you know, you, you're making these, this obvious choice that the, the, the audience knows you're going to go with this guy and not that guy. You just have to make the ride fun. You know, and there's, a, there's, a, uh, there's an invisibleness that you work hard to get. What do you mean? You never want to have a, a joke be boom, 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 here, here are the three beats and then here's the joke. You know, you don't want to see the anatomy of something like that. You know, it's a, it's, it's a lot about rhythm and it's so much about the words and uh, a lot of times in movies it's not about the words, but in a comedy it, it really is. It's about, it's almost mathematical, the, the beats of things. Nora Ephron has said that you like to bring in your own props. Do you do that sometimes? Sometimes, yeah. What does that do for you? Well, I like to find things for the characters to wear and the characters to, uh, sort of a secret thing that they might have somewhere. I, I like a little, I like to give the characters some kind of secret. Do you? Mm -hmm. How many times have we heard that word on this stage? Uh, it's, it's a very, it turns out to be a very, very important word, secrets. Mm -hmm. And I, I found that I like, I don't like to be, you know, really heavily directed. I like to just, everyone to have faith in everyone else and know that it's gonna, you know, I, I don't like to be whispered in my ear before, I don't like my hand held, I don't, I just, I just feel like, okay, just let me out there, let me do it, let me be bad for a while, because I'm gonna be bad, and then let me be good. This is what Nora Ephron has said. If you didn't know how much work Meg puts into figuring it out, you would think it was just something that she did on the spur of the moment, but it's not. She really is killing herself at all times to make it work as humor. I've told her a million times she's Carol Lombard, but the truth is, says Nora, she's probably better. <laughs> what was it like working with Rob Reiner? Um, I got very spoiled by almost everything that happened on that movie. I mean, from the, the care that he took with, with me and with Billy and with his script and his crew and, and what a fantastic audience he is. I mean, he'd be next to the camera I remember we did the scene where, you know, she's ordering, my, Sally is ordering apple pie. Mm -hmm. And Rob would be like right next to the camera and he had this big white sweatshirt on just, and then laughing and kind of, kind of ruining some takes. So <laughs> be, be pleased, Rob, I mean, he was such a, it was so great that he was as, sometimes he'd mouth the words along with you and it just was great. And the, um, and the process beforehand of, 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 working, of working out the beats and working out, and particularly in a comedy, you, you just, you need to know those things. You need to know in a script where, where it's going to fly, where it's going to climax, and you need to know that about every scene. You know, and he talked a lot about thematics, and so would Nora, and it was, it was just a great, fantastic bunch of people. What did they mean by thematics? Well, this is a, you know, this is a story about can men and women be friends. This is about the anatomy of a relationship between a man and a woman. And let's really dig in there and look at it and not be prototypical or typical, be specific. And in that way, you know, universal. Rob Reiner on Meg Ryan. She's the best actress I've ever worked with. Uh, what was it like working with Billy Crystal? Great. I mean, I think that was maybe his second or third movie, you know, I, I, I think. And so it, it was great because I think we were all sort of like held hands and went forward like this because, um, you know, he'd come from stand-up and his relationship was really with the audience, you know, and he was all about learning how to be with the other actor. This is Billy Crystal on Meg Ryan. Meg is everybody you ever wanted to go out with in high school who said no to you? <laughs> <laughs> I, 
I would, of course, lose my license as an interviewer if I didn't ask you for some details about the scene. Mm. Um, what, was it in the script originally? No. What was in the script? Um, I think that they had it. I'm not even sure it was in the original script, but maybe I think maybe it was a discussion about the fact that women fake orgasms, which is different than actually doing it. Whose idea was it to, to uh, prove it by faking one? I, it just came up in the, those few weeks beforehand. Somehow we were all, you know, like kind of sitting around this table, and I don't know whose idea it was, but it was, it just sort of occurred that we should do that. Everybody else on the movie says it was your idea. I know. I don't... <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I, it's a very good idea. Yeah, I guess, right? And. <laughs> but... <laughs> Well, can you think quickly, everybody, rummage through your minds, is there a more famous moment in motion pictures in the last uh, 10 years? There are several that equal it, but none more famous than that moment. Um, it was an inspiration. Uh, I understand that Billy Crystal did come up with the line that was spoken by, I think, Rob Reiner's mother. Yeah. And that line was? Yeah. I'll have what she's having. <laughs> Incredible. <clears throat> How many times did you have to have that oh, just orgasm? all day. All day. <laughs> we just got there and rehearsed it. That was the worst thing was doing it first, the rehearsal, because yeah. the, you know no one's in their <laughs> no one's in their little outfits yet or anything, and you know the extras are in and out of makeup and everyone's lining up and no one's heard it before and it's just horrible. <laughs> but um, yeah, and then we just did it all day and Rob and his way of participating, you know, with every breath would be next to the camera doing his thing too. And <laughs> <laughs> And since you are female and he's male, it may have been a hell of a lot oh harder goodness. on him than it was on you. Yeah. No, he had a couple of good sounds, you know, that he was volunteering. But <laughs> that I should try out. Um, and then Billy's face, which I couldn't look at, because he just... The scene works because of how he reacts to er everything. You know, he, it's, he's incredible. I think you both had a hand in it. Uh, didn't the people at the deli give you a, a, a present? It's a huge health salami. Like, it's huge. Fat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Meg, this is for you, honey! <laughs> uh, do women ever ask you about that scene? Yeah, they used to, yeah. yeah. Didn't you once say you were going to make an instructional video? <laughs> I said I should do some sort of tape. <laughs> as amazing as that scene is, and it is amazing, it's, a, it's an extraordinary piece of acting, period. Uh, for me, there's another scene in that movie, which I think is your ticket to ride to glory. And that is the scene in which you ask him to come over and comfort you. Oh, yeah. Because Joe is getting married. <laughs> if you could take him back right now, would you? Challenging. I'm too structured. I'm completely closed off. But in a good way. No, no, no. I drove him away. And I'm going to be 40. When? Someday. In eight years. But it's there. It's just sitting there like this big dead end. And it's not the same for men. Charlie Chaplin had babies when he was 73. Yeah, but he was too old to pick them up. <laughs> come here, come here. Amazing scene to do, too, because right then I wasn't believing in those, um, those, those menthol things that can make you cry. Yeah. <laughs> so it was a thing like you orgasm all day, and then you just cry all day. <laughs> that was, that and was... you didn't use any devices for either one? No. No, no. <laughs> <coughs> I want to talk uh, about, a little bit about Joe versus the Volcano. Yeah. Um, because for one thing, it marked the directing debut of a very, very good writer, mm -hmm. John Patrick Shanley. You know, it's, it's striking me though, t tonight that, you know, the things that for me were really 
important watershed things for me as a, you know, as an actor, mm -hmm. were these things that n no one would notice. It's so interesting to me, you know, like Promised Land was such a big thing for me, bigger than, you know, whatever Top Gun did at the box office, sure. you know? So, w w Joe versus the Volcano was such a big changing point for me, because I, got, first of all, I got to play these characters who were, you know, so other than me. I mean, one was this little mousy, um, kind of, sort of a typist or something at this odd business. That it was Tom, Dee Dee. Dee Dee, that Tom Hanks worked at. And the other one was this You very, had a New York accent for Dee Dee, didn't yeah, you? Yeah, she did, yeah. She was very provincial. Very, very, very sweet, scared girl. The important thing was to, with John Shanley, he was the first guy who said to me that I didn't have to do anything right. That I just had to do it. Right. And I mean, my acting teacher, Peggy Fury, had said that a long time ago, but I guess I'd forgotten it, you know? Mm -hmm. you, you go through thinking, oh, I guess I gotta, I gotta do this the right way, and then the next thing, you know? And all of it, you can just throw away. Sure. Because it, it's just not about doing anything right. It's just about trying to express whatever it is that the audience wants to see. And no matter what you do to plan, I mean, you, there is a, so much thinking that goes into it, but all of it is just gone by, for me now by day one, by the first day of shooting. I like to forget it all. And John was so great. I mean, this is a, it's such a strange, wonderful movie. And, and these, these characters were, for me, she, Edidi, was this infant, and the second one. Angelica. Angelica what was, was she? A, she was the adolescent. You know, it's a Jungian kind of fairy tale. He introduced yeah. me to Carl Jung, and he talked to me about art, and he... he, he was very, Shanley was very inspiring to me. And, and, um, and, and, and a word about Angelica. She was also very snobbish and imperious, wasn't she? Well, she was very, you know, she had... Uh, there she goes. She just had the, a fake voice. She had... I, I made them do my wig, so they gave me, like, kind of a little weird facelift when, of course, she didn't need one. And <laughs> it was like... And this, uh, this... This... I went to this one restaurant in L.A., and I just looked around, and, oh, my God, there she was. And I just, you know, copied her. She thought she was a poetess. And this woman was reading poetry, this awful poetry, to this uh, person she was dining with who was basically sleeping, you know, through the, <laughs> through the whole episode. I thought, oh, my God, that's her. And, and it, was, it was just, she just came out of me. It was great. The third character was Patricia. Yeah, the one I had trouble with. Why and did I, you have trouble with I her? Because she was the he'd one say, seemed most like yeah, you. Yeah, he'd say, do it like you would do it. And I'd be like, oh, my God, I just can't. I don't have a weird voice. I don't have a strange clothes. I don't have the, this in the glasses. I don't... I don't think I can. And so, and it was, uh, it was really coming face to face with that that made me g kind of take other roles that were closer to me. She was very decent in principle. Yeah, Independent. Yeah. She was a wonderful character. Yeah. Here goes Shanley on Meg Ryan. He tells a story of the director of photography putting a light meter up to Meg's face for the first time after he had lit the scene with her stand-in and he recoiled and turned to Shanley and said, her face, Meg's face, reflects 200 times more light than the other person's. <laughs> That's radiance, huh? <laughs> what drew you to, uh, I'm sure I can guess, a lot of reasons, good reasons, to flesh and bone? Oh, great script, great director. Um, and again, it was this idea, for me, it was very interesting that this woman, her problem was not that she had too many defenses up and therefore couldn't be in her life, but was that she had none. And none at all. What was your take on Kay? You, you've spoken of her as a professional screw-up. Yep. Um, I mean, the first scene, too, I loved her uh, opening. She's stripping it, you know, coming out of a cake or yeah. something at somebody's wedding, and she throws up on the groom. And I just thought that was great. So, uh... <laughs> she is a drifter, right? Yeah. Uh, where did you shoot this picture? Texas, all over Texas, all over Austin, and we moved west, west, west. We moved every, like, week to, so we finally ended up in Marfa, Texas. Do you like location shooting? Yeah, Why? I do. I like it because you're in the environment, you're with the people, you're, you have that, again, that, that community is very important all of a sudden because you're in your little bubble. Because you and Dennis were such different people in this movie. Um, he has spoken to the fact that you would, the two of you would be in bed at night in the hotel. You with your script on one side of the bed, him with his script on the other. Mm -hmm. We wouldn't even run lines. <laughs> we wouldn't, no. 
Sleepless in Seattle reunited you with Nora Ephron, this time as a director. And obviously, that relationship was hugely successful. How did you and Nora work on this film? I think you may have had a very active role. We, we tried to make decisions about mm -hmm. her being somebody who was like everyone. Do you know? I mean, just that it had her limited life, and there was something calling her, but she didn't know what it was. And in this movie, it takes the play, it it's in the guise of this uh, voice. She was a journalist. Yeah, a journalist, right. At last. <laughs> yeah, she was a lifestyle journalist. You know, she'd write about pudding and things. Does the fact that Nora is a woman, did that figure in the way in which she directed you? Were, were you able to communicate with her in a way that you might not have been able yeah, to communicate with her? Yeah, I think I have a real shorthand with her. I mean, I, I, my take on my relationship with her is that she writes the music, and I just hope I hit the notes, because she can really write moments. You've called her the star of the movie. Oh, yeah, because her heart is all over her movies, too. She's on record, Nora is, that Sleepless isn't about love. It's about love in the movies. What an interesting idea. Mm. It's not quite real. Just like, that's so perfect romantic comedy because yeah. it's just not quite really happening. It's what you hope would happen, is what you dream would happen. It's who you'd hope you'd be. Uh, apart from the opportunity to work with Nora, uh, what, what specifically appealed to you about the role of Annie Reed? Obviously, you had a terrific take on it. You know, more, more than the role, really, it was the story. It was this idea that somewhere, somehow, somebody out there is meant for me. You know, here I am. And the dream and the hope that there's somebody out there really destined for me is, I think, the thing that I really hooked into as a reader. And so that was just about serving the story. You know, a lot of times you get into a situation where you're not serving a story, where you're having to make these sort of adjustments in your character to make the thing interesting. But this, the story is so strong, and the narrative works so, so s specific that there's, uh, you know, kind of just let the movie do its work, the story do its work. You've described Annie, though, as an anachronism. Yeah, very old-fashioned girl. She is. Yeah. Um, you're not an old-fashioned girl. Are well, you? I don't think so. Was she a stretch for you then? Are you like yeah, Annie? Yeah, I, I, she kind of was. I mean, it seems so weird to say that, but it, it is. I mean, she was so kind of normal, I couldn't figure out a way to... I still don't honestly think that I did it all that great, but I, I you're think... You're wrong. Okay, thanks, but... <laughs> I think she was so something so average that it was hard for me to get. Then I realized that, you know, that's the sort of the point. The point is she doesn't take chances. She but you're a person who's taken and... huge chances yeah. in your life, aren't you? Yeah. This was your second film with Tom Hanks, but, of course, you never met until the end. You probably didn't see him at all during the whole shoot. The whole no, shoot. I think he was like water skiing or something when I was shooting. And yet you've said about him, I don't feel as if I've had enough of him yet. No, he no. must be dazzling to work with. Oh. It's so, it's so great to watch someone like that, who is such a wonderful person, be as good as he is, too. It is dazzling to watch him. And I, could, I, saw, I saw him in dailies, you know, every now and then, you know, what he did with the role, so, yeah. yeah. And when you're shooting, do you like to go to dailies? Uh, in the beginning, I like to go a little bit. I don't always do it, but in the beginning, I like to see what the director's seeing, because sometimes you think you're making the same movie and you're not. <laughs> They're seeing entirely different things than you are. All through the, the uh, picture, everybody's always watching an affair to remember. And when you go running to the Empire State Building, and we're wondering whether you're going to miss them or not, mm -hmm. the kid has lured his father there, mm -hmm. and it's an mm -hmm. exquisite scene. And in it, you say and do almost nothing. If you want to have a look at some very good acting, watch Tom Hanks and Meg look at each other. And we know what the rest of their lives will be like. And all you do is just look at each other. That's so nice, yeah. You're Annie. This must be yours. I'm Jonah. This is my dad. His name's Sam. Hi, Jonah. Sam. And who's this? Howard. Howard. Hello, Howard.
We better go. Shall we? Again, you know, it's, there was really just nothing to do, you know. I, Rob Reiner would say that very, uh, every now and then on the, when Harry met Sally, just, just especially at the end of the movie, try to do nothing. <laughs> and then he'd say about listening and reacting that, that really, it's not, uh, this is so true too, it's really not about you, it's about the other actor. Mm -hmm. And try not to make it about you, make it about the other person, you know. And that, and even in a bigger way, it's not about you in the sense that you're an, an instrument for storytelling. Mm -hmm. It's not about me, Meg Ryan. It's about, it's about the audience. And a lot of times that gets lost in, when you're working on a film. Because you you, you there's just, no audience there. Because there's no audience there. But you, and then th beyond that, there's all this other stuff that goes on in the, uh, you know, on a movie set. But you forget. There's nothing to forget. It's always the thing to remember that it's really not even going for people's intellect, you're going for their hearts, you know, you're going for an experience of, 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 for the audience. In a summer full of the usual action blockbusters, this sensitive romantic comedy outgrossed them all. It earned $150 million that summer, proving perhaps that story, strong story, and well-developed characters can compete with car chases and disasters. After When Harry Met Sally and Sleepless in Seattle, you must have had an interesting array of projects to choose from. How do you choose a project? What says to you finally, yes, this is the one I have to do? It's just always about the writing for me. It's always, always about that. I, um... I think you've said on occasion that if the role scares you, then you begin to be tempted. Yeah. It's odd, you know, you read something, you go, this is so great, yes, I gotta do it, I gotta do it, and then you get to the moment where you're just, how am I gonna do this? <laughs> how am I gonna, how am I even gonna begin to do this? What drew you to When a Man Loves a Woman? Very, very interesting movie. There were women's issues in that, were there not? Oh, Some there were very all strong. kinds of issues. I loved th about that movie that it was really about staying together, not getting together. That it's a movie more about, I mean, we have so much mythology about getting together and, you know, Sleepless in Seattle ends when they meet. That's right. But this is a marriage. It and ends with their hands. Yeah. That's it. There's very little in the culture to look up to and say, oh, how, did they, how did they make it work? And yet it's something that we all try to do. Mm -hmm. And uh, I love that the obstacle to, these, to this love story was something totally ingrained in the people, in the characters, in their problems, in their in her alcoholism, but not really about alcoholism, really. It's more about two people getting to know each other. Yeah. And, and accepting each other. And accepting each other, yeah. You've described this film as an emotional catharsis for you, was it? I loved every single second of doing that movie, because Andy Garcia is such an experimental guy. I mean, he really will try anything. We, we never did one take the same. Really? It was great. It was so interesting. It was always interesting. And in this movie, I think we shot more footage than I'd ever in my life shot. And it's all very emotional stuff. And it was not exhausting. It was, it, it was, it was, gr it was incredibly great. And you were playing falling down drunk in it. Mm -hmm. Big thing, tough thing to do. Yeah. Did you, how did you work on the drunkenness? Well, uh, it's that thing of trying to control yourself. Uh, I, first of all, you watch a lot. You feel it. You try it. You see it. Well, I try to w witness yourself when you're <laughs> drunk, which I tried. It doesn't really work. And, um, well, if you're really drunk, then you're not going to remember much of anything. Look what I'm doing, my God. Yeah. But, um, <laughs> but uh, that was a lot about watching people and then thinking, you know, really what it is is this overcompensation. It's really trying hard to walk straight. Yes, you know? I agree. And, th and it's the effort that you see towards normal behavior. And a lot of that character was her effort towards normal, guessing it normal, you know, having high hopes about everything, and then this particularly herself, and then not living up to them, and then thinking she failed in everybody else's eyes. I like guessing it normal. What a good way to say it. Um, there's a very, very good scene in which you finally declare yourself to him and say, I want to feel good. Yeah. 
I'd get drunk, I'd pass out, and you'd put me back together. That was the best, huh? That made you feel good. And that's what hurts. feel like a stupid, worthless, weak animal. With French Kiss, you became a co-producer. Mm -hmm. I, I noticed something at this point as I was reviewing all of your movies. You seem to be attracted to characters who must open themselves up to life, who begin by being closed and then have to open from Sally yeah. to Annie in Sleepless to Alice in When a Man Loves a Woman to Kate in French Kiss. Is that a conscious pattern? Are you drawn to those no, characters? No, but I've realized that lately, too. Why Prufrock Productions for your production company? I just love that poem. Uh, the poem to me is such a, you know, love song. Uh, a meditation on life, and that's what I think movies at their best really are. A meditation on life. Yeah. A rumination, a meditation. Yeah. Finally, for our students, more than half of whom are women, Meg, what lies ahead for them in a male professional world? Well, I would say first, be optimistic, because I think it's changing. I mean, there are more and more women now in, in the business part, in, this, in the studio system, or not in the studio system, who, are, who have a say and who are, who are, are greenlighting movies that, that are, aren't your typical, you know, uh, male-driven movie. And I would, I would say more than anything, but be try to remember your humanity, not just your femininity. And that, yes, that serves your, your m human nature, but that sometimes I, I see a lot of women get very angry, and it stops the creative process. It not only stops it in them, it stops them in the people that surround them. Mm -hmm. And I think it's dangerous to let yourself uh, stay in that anger. We end each evening with the questionnaire invented by Bernard Pivot and Apostrophe and Bouillon de Culture. And I would like to ask you, please, Meg, what is your favorite word? Authentic. What is your least favorite word? Enjoy. It makes me nuts when people say enjoy, because it, it just makes me feel like they don't really enjoy what they're enjoying. Right. <laughs> Oh, I really enjoyed the evening. Oh, God. That's, that's what's wrong Say with it you. one way or the other. That's what's you wrong with it. You hated it or you loved it. Um, what turns you on? What thing would you say turns you Absolute on? Absolute honesty. Okay. What turns you off? When a pretzel gets wet. <laughs> Nobody said that before. <laughs> <laughs> what, <laughs> what sound or noise do you love? Um, I love the sound of after my little boy in his bed, just before he falls asleep. I don't know what he does in there, but he's always going, ah, da, da, da. he's singing little <laughs> songs to himself. He's, I don't know what he's doing in there, but it's just the most beautiful crystalline sound. Nice. What sound or noise do you hate? That airplane engine revving up, <laughs> ready to go. I just don't like it. What is your favorite curse word? My favorite curse word? Um, f me. <laughs> I was like, oh, f me. I say that a lot. <laughs> <clears throat> what profession other than yours would you like to attempt? Oh, really? Yes. I'd like to attempt. My God, who would have me? <laughs> um, 500 I'd be, people out here. <laughs> I, sometimes I imagine that I could uh, 
Sometimes I like the idea of being in advertising a little bit, and I like the idea of maybe being an architect. Hmm. What profession would you not like to participate in? Anything with numbers. <laughs> Any accounting type gotcha. situation. Or piloting, which involves numbers. Sure it does. Yeah. But that's the fun of it. Right. Especially when you get there. Mm -hmm. If heaven exists, what would you like to hear God say when you arrive? You big dope, I've been with you all along. <laughs> <laughs> he has been with you all along. Uh -huh. So have we. We are very grateful to you for coming here tonight and sharing your life and art with us. Thank you very, Thank very you. much. Thank you. know each other really, really well. Yeah. You do, right? <laughs> We've had about six or seven marriages in the program. <laughs> Not in this class. Yes, uh, we have marriages and babies and relationships. Wow. I've asked for a list. That's a good acting class. I, Go. After, after, after three years, I'm beginning to feel like Noah. <laughs> Hi, Megan. Hi. My name is Danny. Hi. Um, my question is about how would you, how do you keep a relationship going? Um, my girlfriend's also in the program, and we find it so hard to find time together to spend because yeah. we never see each other except yeah. when we get home at night and on weekends. Well, um, it's, it's great you guys do the same thing, right? Because there's a sort of shorthand that you, that you get to have. Um, how do we keep it going? Oh, my God. Well. We just try not to take it all too seriously, number one. We try not to be apart for too long. And then we do, like, ridiculous things, like, um, like we just went around the world, for instance. <laughs> we, just, like, we just got back about three days ago from going all the way around the world. And we both were working and you know, kind of off and on through the, through the fall. And we said, that's it. We're doing something incredibly extravagant. We're doing it. And so we did with my little boys, four. And, Dennis and I, and it was a great adventure, just the three of us. It was great. Hello, my name is Nadej, and I'm an actress. Hi. Uh, how are you? Um, is it true that uh, your director for When a Man Loves a Woman made you use dream work as part of your preparation? Yeah. That fascinates me. Would you please yeah. tell us a little bit more about that? I had never done it before, and I really thought, this is such a really going to do it before, you know? <laughs> All right, I'll just pretend I had a dream that's relevant, you know? I, then, <laughs> like, oh, well, I gotta make one up on the way, you know? Uh, <laughs> but it turned out to be a really great thing. It, what he did was, uh, he said, he's a very good friend of mine now, and I, uh, but anyway, he, um, he said, okay, before you go to sleep, but we're gonna th the assignment is to think about, to the, we're going to rehearse these scenes tomorrow. And so think about those scenes. It's all you have to do is just, before you go to sleep, tell yourself you want to dream about those scenes. He, Andy would have these long, outrageous dreams, you know, like these crazy epic dreams that we'd be like, oh, my God, is that dream ever going to end Andy? <laughs> and, <laughs> and my dreams are like, there's a hand, and it comes out of the water. You know, <laughs> those are my dreams. Yeah, they grab me and I can't do the scene. But, <laughs> but Luis is really great at interpreting all those things, like, you know, what did the hand mean to you? And, what it, and really, I mean, whether you believe in that stuff or not, it got us into these in, sort of intense discussions about um, obstacles in our lives, things we were afraid of, stuff that, uh, stuff that we used eventually in, in the movie. And the other great thing was that my, I learned a lot from my husband because he's, you know, a, a genius, and he works with other geniuses. <laughs> and he worked with Meryl Streep one time, and of course I was just like, I've got to go see, I've got to like, you know, peek through and <coughs> watch and watch everything, watch what's going on. And, uh, and then I made him tell me everything. And she even just sort of just goes, and is sometimes bad. And then the next time, she's free enough. That, and it's all about that. It's all about being f really free enough, getting rid of yourself enough to just be an instrument. 
Hi, Miss Ryan. My name Hi. is Maria, and I'm confused about something you said about Joe versus the volcano. Uh -huh. You said that the character that was more similar to you was the hardest one to play. Shouldn't it be the other way around? You would think, right? Yeah. But <laughs> it, it was just true for me. I was surprised, too, and I learned this about myself. And acting is so great because even though, you know, it's not therapy, it is in a certain way. And in this case, I learned that I, even though when I was in this other kind of thing, I was much more comfortable in the wig and the weird hairdo and the strange eye makeup than I was just kind of being there. And then I had to kind of think about why that, why that was and try to be a little courageous about that and try to say, well, why is that? Why am I happier not as me? Why is it more comfortable, you know? And I had to, I had to figure that out. And you, everyone has to figure that out. Hi, Mary. Okay. My name is Gail, and I'm an actor. And I really wasn't going to ask a question because I'm so nervous. I've watched you since you were on As, As the, the World, world Turns. Turns. Oh, my exactly. God. Exactly. I watched you grow. I watched you do everything. <laughs> <laughs> and you're still nervous? Yeah. <laughs> but um, we s <laughs> in our studies here, we do a lot of work um, with sense memory, substitution, mm -hmm. etc. cetera. Mm -hmm. I would like to know when you, that famous, infamous scene mm. at the table in the diner, <laughs> when you gave that very realistic orgasm. Was that Were sense you? memory? <laughs> <laughs> yes, was that sense memory? <laughs> um, well, it was a couple things, really. That you, you, uh, partly. <laughs> um, the other thing was just thinking about it had to be very extreme. It had to t get the attention of a room full of people in a deli in New York City, you know? <laughs> and that was what was scary about it. It, it just had to be scary. big. I was thinking, maybe someone could just massage my feet under the table. <laughs> <laughs> maybe someone could just, <laughs> you know? But ultimately, no, I just had to make an idiot out of myself. Oh, my very, very, very. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Meg. Hi. My name is Hamilton. Hi. Uh, it seems to me like the greatest question about acting is really this dichotomy between it's not about you you know it's yeah. really about the audience but it, it is you who is called upon to feel and live those emotions yeah as an instrument y you want to be able to know what it is in your experience that will serve the character mm -hmm. you don't want this that other stuff in the way you want to free yourself up you want to you want to stay as clear as you can be for that object for that final thing that the audience will feel what it is that the playwright, the movie writer, the director wanted them to, to feel. The reality is I am this set of experiences which I have interpreted and I have had and therefore I, I can't ever be just a clear, uh, for me, this is just for me, a clear lens between the story and the audience. I'm a prism at best. Because I am, and you all are, and we all are, and that's why, you know, it's not why we're here, but it's our, all our lives are a, a, a collection of those, all those characters' lives that you're going to play are a collection of those things. And so uh, uh, me and my experience in my life and the things that have happened to me and the stuff that I know is in some way going to seep in in some way to a, a, a character. You interpret things differently than, than you interpret things. And that's what's great about this art form, is that you will interpret different than you will, and that we will see it and see something new, because you did it and you didn't, or you did it and you didn't. I think that's what's glorious. <laughs>